know, in our revised program, uh, we have only one talk uh, now, between now and lunch. And to make the timing work out, we're going to give Alex uh, two hours. <laughs> the second hour is to eat lunch, so <laughs> you actually have your regular time plus five. Thanks, Herman and Mark, for organizing this. It's nice to be here. Uh, first, I will show you an appetizer. This is a simulation of a de Broglie wave packet going through a nano grating. And you see over here the emergence of some far field diffraction. These orders are used in some experiments I'll describe. In this moment, you also see interactions, Van der Waals interactions between the matter wave and the surfaces of this structure. So you'll see these themes, the far field diffraction with phase coherence between the paths and the interactions with the structure recur in my lecture. And I'll speak about four different things. In that uh, simulation, Alex, the, the wave packet also had limited transverse size as well, right? Yes. Okay. But it was obeying the Schrodinger equation in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. And that code is in the grad student's thesis on our webpage, atomwave.org. So I've done some work with electron interferometry using nanostructures. And that's very exploratory in nature, trying to figure out what can we do with the uh, tools that were developed for atom optics and x-ray optics and apply them now to electron optics. And then I'll tell you about some atom interferometry work that is more metrological in spirit, heading towards precision measurements of polarizabilities or van der Waals interactions. <laughs> and then back to a few uh, discovery directions at the end. There's some things I just don't understand about why we don't get decoherence with the electrons going through these structures. So as background, it was a pleasure to write this review with Dave and Jorg. There are more than 700 references in here, thanks to many experts like the people in the audience. Uh, and the domain of this work was all about coherent matter wave optics a lot of different tools and applications. In this talk, I'll just focus on one tool, and that's the nano gratings. So this is the type of structure that's built here at MIT. And if we zoom in, you can see the freestanding bars. And here we've ripped away a part of the structure. So I don't build these. I've just learned to carefully break them in order to do new experiments. And this is the start, then, of part one. If you look closely, there's quite a texture on the nanostructure surface. We have deposited AUPD, sputter-coated metal, here. And with, it's a thick enough layer that it looks like crack mud from Tucson. So this is a very irregular, um, imperfect, fabricated surface. Um, and here, the nanograding bars aren't all exactly the same size. So we may ask the question, is it even possible to get coherent transmission diffraction of electrons Dave Pritchard, who was my postdoc advisor, told me that would be very hard to do. For one thing, because if you put an atom here, you only have a, a micro electron volt interaction potential with the surface due to the van der Waals force. But if you put an electron at that same spot, 10 nanometers from a surface, the potential energy is 100,000 times larger. So electron image charge interactions are much larger. and Furthermore, if there's some charge already on the surface, well, the problem just gets worse. You can have irregular phase shifts uh, that may even change in time. So with uh, Herman Batalon kind of at the same time, we decided to try it. And in different ways, this is what we saw. An SEM image of the nanograding looks like this. And if you take the same beam in the same electron microscope and just focus it three centimeters beyond the grating, well, you can see the transmission is actually uh, focused as an electron beam can be focused, but now shows up in multiple beams. So that's an example of a coherent process of diffraction. If you look at the intensities here, they're asymmetric. So in this regard, Dave was right. These transmitted spots were not unaffected by the image charge. These different intensities shown here, uh, in fact, bring with them information about the electron surface interactions. So here's a simulation of traveling waves going through these slots. And although I've only shown about eight wavefronts in this 
100 nanometer long channel, there should be 8,000 in there to represent the 1 keV electrons that we are using. Uh, so with 8,000 wavefronts, they get a bigger phase shift on this side than this side because they spend more time passing close to a surface over here. See, this point acts like an aperture for this side. And as a result, the uh, phase fronts here tend to send more flux in this direction. The uh, far field's interference due to this pattern um, gives you higher intensity in this diffraction order. If you continue rotating the structure, as we did in the lab, you get the opposite effect, where there's more flux going this way, and this other order peaks up. So this is now a way to measure the electron image charge interaction for single electrons, one at a time, passing through the nano gratings. And that trapezoidal structure, it's not a myth. It really is well known that these uh, nano gratings have that shape. So we've, we saw that diffraction worked pretty well. And now we've seen up to 15 orders of diffraction using a new type of camera that I'll tell you about. Again, that's with a focused beam going through the gratings. The next thing we did is ask, well, can you build an interferometer? And so we built two types of interferometers, both of which use two gratings. And this one uses a collimated beam, so you get to see, in fact, this is a, a map. As you move one grating back and forth, you can see the total transmission in this collimated beam is uh, modulated. So you get maxima in transmission when this is lined up with the Fourier self-images downstream of the first grating. And as you move this grating farther away, there's no longer contrast, and then the contrast comes back. So this is an example of a Talbot carpet. The Lau interferometer works in a somewhat different way. It can tolerate incoherent beams, uh, but it's helpful if the beams come from a relatively small spot. So again, we're taking advantage of a tool that's common in electron optics, but we just didn't have as easily available in atom optics. That's the lens to change between the collimated beam or a beam focused down here, or in this case, the broadly diverging beam. And this is an image of the fringes formed on this last plane. So many of you in the field of atom optics are more familiar with the talbot lau interferometers. That's a three grating device. And that's similar to this, where the third grating is instead replaced by a screen. So I'll tell you a little more about this one and some of its applications. If you look at a propagating beam going through an absorption grating, if the beam isn't perfectly coherent, then it looks more like this. And so we have a beam that's nearly plane waves, but has uh, phase here not perfectly correlated with phase there. And as a result, I'd say there's four regimes that are predicted for this wave propagating. Right after the grating, there's a shadow of the grating. When you go downstream to what's called the Talbot distance, you see the near field interference brings a copy of the grating. And so that's a, a special distance that is given by d squared over lambda, multiplied by 2 if you want this uh, second revival that's right in phase. So 2 d squared over lambda is the Talbot distance. And if you go downstream a little more, the near field interferences are washed out. And that depends, again, on the, the coherence properties of the incident beam. You could have this persist a lot longer or less in distance. And finally, the far field diffraction is more familiar. So that Talbot interferometer uses a second grating right in this region to block or transmit those maxima. And we did this for a few different wavelength electron beams. And we see the Talbot length, which is shown here in red, uh, agrees very well with the location of the observed fringes in this near field interference. Now, we went to this lower energy, slightly longer wavelength uh, beam. And we didn't see very much contrast in these revivals. So this could be the start of something really interesting. Is this Hasselbach style decoherence due to the electrons leaving an imprint in the grating and having a record left in the grating that could tell you which slot did each electron go through? You say you doubt it. And uh, I agree that I can't use this as evidence for a new type of decoherence because so many things change. When you change the electron beam energy, uh, 
from 4 k volts down to 2 k volts, the beam gets harder to focus. So we open the aperture, so we have less tr transverse coherence. And so these uh, rapidly decaying um, Talbot carpets are just a signature of the electron beam not being as coherent when it was incident on the, on the interferometer. So it doesn't, it's not a smoking gun of some new type of decoherence happening with the gratings itself. So that's already curious. I'll get back to that at the end of my talk. <clears throat> we also built this Lau interferometer, which allows us to put in a phase object here. Did you want to ask a question no, about we're just that? Discussing okay, I'm happy to. Formulas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this should be a movie of how the fringes can change in real time if we put in a charged wire here. So a needle that acts kind of like a lightning rod, makes an electric field gradient. And this may, in some sense, be called an electron holography machine, even though it's not two completely separated paths with a pristinely preserved reference wave. Uh, here in the Lau interferometer, the waves are traveling paths that overlap. So it's a shearing interferometer. You get distortions in the fringes only if you have different gradients in phase around here and here. So it's to, it is a way of reporting gradients and index of refraction for the electron waves that have traveled from here via this path or from here via some other path in this same grating. So this is the kind of knob that I wish we had in our atom interferometer. The ability to, uh, to see the fringes, first of all, and to, to read them out in real time, this is a great advance in terms of the uh, technology in the lab compared to the business with atom beams that are hard to focus and require a fair amount of integration before you observe the signal. So if we were using a third grating here and just had a big integrating detector, fringes like this would just result in zero contrast. So this may be an application. And by the way, this is working with a tungsten filament here. So one of the not very bright, uh, allegedly quite incoherent sources is still useful to do this kind of um, holography thanks to nano gratings. And I should point out a Talbot interferometer with the parallel beam or a Lau interferometer like this. Neither of these had been built before because with traditional methods of electron diffraction from natural crystals, uh, it's very hard to get the right distance. <coughs> the, the Talbot distance would just be so short and the crystal period is so fine that the alignment in the twist direction is so difficult that these represent small advances thanks to nanogratings. So it's a true application for nanogratings to enable these types of interferometers. Here's the apparatus. It's an old uh, scanning electron microscope. We can put two gratings in here, and we can rock them and translate them with respect to each other and the beam. We needed this large amount of extra space just a traveling working distance. So we, instead of having the focus at one centimeter from the objective lens, we now put the focus at one meter from the objective lens in order to study diffraction. And down here, we've used about eight different types of detectors. If you're interested in the details of this field, I'll discuss those with you later. The best detector that seemed like it was the most useful for this work is a direct readout of electrons on a CCD. So no um, multi-channel plates or no phosphor in this apparatus. Um, it can work at modest vacuum, 10 to the minus 5 tor. It's fine. And when the electrons hit there, they just get read out in the charged coupled device. And it can work down to pretty low energies. So we saw images like this of the diffracted beam with the various intensities that reveal image charge interaction strengths. Here was the higher energy beam, and the interference fringes can be like that. We also did some work to simulate various uh, traveling wave effects through grating interferometers. And so we, we started using this tool called the Gaussian shell model. And with that, we can do all these five tasks with one formula. We can predict uh, the pattern known as the Talbot carpet. We can show the far field diffraction. We can even look at Moxender interferometers, all using this Gaussian shell model. 
So in this simulation, we haven't observed this yet, but it's like the uh, dream that I heard Dave Pritchard mention once. If you could just get a nice focusing lens in front of the atom interferometer, the beam is propagating this way. And if you could have the beam, a wide beam that's focused, well, then you can have one path that's the zeroth order transmission and the first order transmission very clearly separated. So you can do this um, classical experiment where you put a phase shifting object in one arm and not the other. And you get this diamond very clearly delineated thanks to having a lens. Uh, in order to achieve this in the lab, we're reduced to such extreme measures as throwing away most of the atoms and having a collimating slit. So to be able to use wide beams with a lens uh, could make fringes that appear like this. And the fringes actually change in period as you go further away, because now you should think of them as uh, the interferences of spherically expanding waves. They've gone through a beam waste here. So these fringes can still be read out with a third grating, but you better put it in the right place. Because if you put it in the wrong spot, it'll have an incommensurate period. So to summarize this work on electron optics, we've demonstrated diffraction. I talked a bit about the Talbot interferometer and the Lau interferometer. With those, we've been able to measure wavefront radius of curvature fairly precisely. So these electron waves have a 10 to the minus 11 meter wavelength. And we've been able to detect a 2 meter radius of curvature. So that 11 orders of magnitude difference between those scales is natural to understand because the Talbot effect gives you an enhancement in sensitivity that scales like the diffraction angle. So it's about 5 orders of magnitude. And we illuminated some 10,000 grading bars in that experiment. So to see this wavefront radius of curvature, it was the Talbot geometry. We also learned how to measure the transverse coherence length, even if it's as small as 5 nanometers. Using a 100 nanometer period as a grating, uh, we can measure coherence lengths that are as small as 5 nanometers, and that's using the Lau geometry. And of course, longer coherence lengths we can measure multiple ways. So what are some applications in the future? I have to be frank and say this exploratory work on electron optics seemed to be worth one PhD student's thesis, but I haven't found the killer application that's going to keep this lab going. Uh, instead, most of my effort is heading towards atom optics. I'll tell you about that next. So I'm looking for applications, and one of them might be to study image charge friction. Uh, another would be to make vortex states, orbital angular momentum beams like uh, Tonomura has recently made. Those could be fabricated with forked gratings, and they may have interesting applications in material science. And this focused Moxender interferometer is an inspiration that I think we can take back to atom optics. OK, so now I'll tell you more about the Atom Beam Lab. Here's uh, Will Holmgren and Vincent Loney, who are the PhD students on this apparatus. Melissa Ravel is now at Rice University, having finished her undergraduate thesis using this machine. And there's Kathy Klaus doing an undergraduate thesis with us. And Will is putting uh, in something where the skimmer is normally located. These are the atom beam sources in a machine that was developed at MIT. And I brought it with me to Tucson. And uh, we put in three nanogratings, one here, here, and here, to make the Pritchard-style atom interferometer. So we start with diffraction, and we can study the intensities in those orders, and put the beams back together. And we see different phases here, here, and here, which we can ascribe to the uh, presence of van der Waals interactions. So we get fringes that don't quite have enough contrast to do what uh, Werner was telling us about, what Helmut Rauch was telling us about. The uh, Bell's inequalities would be hard to study starting with this signal. But at least the signal is strong enough to see in real time on the oscilloscope. And uh, there it is. And now we can look for phase shifts as a measure of polarizability. So that's the nature of our latest experiment, where we apply uh, a large electric field gradient. So with the gradient off, the fringes are in one position. With the gradient on, we see a, a shift. And this experiment, we're applying about 1,000 radians of phase shift for the atoms whose wave function component travels along this path. And for the other branch of the interferometer, there's 995 radians of phase shift. So we see a differential phase shift of five radians. And the apparatus is, is pretty simple. We have this uh, whole combination of electrodes on a translation stage so that with the cylinder here and the ground plane here, 
the two beams go both through the gap, and we can move the whole apparatus back and forth. We can move those electrodes as a pair back and forth. So when one path goes close to the cylinder, we see a bigger differential phase shift. And when both paths go close to the ground plane, we see a smaller phase shift. And of course, these equipotential lines are uh, an indication that the calculation can be done exactly. So we know exactly what the electric field should be everywhere, and we know even in an analytical form what the phase shift is acquired along this whole path. So here's the measured phase shift as a function of the interaction electrode position that we understand the shape of these data indicates that we understand the shape of the electric fields. It's also, to get this properly to fit, crucial for us to include not only the velocity of the atom beam, but the velocity spread of the atom beam and the Earth's rotation rate. So not only are we sensitive to the Sagnac phase that makes about five radians of phase shift, but that compounded with the spread in velocity for the atom beam would give us the wrong result for polarizability by almost 1% if we didn't get the uh, latitude of Tucson and the duration of one day uh, properly in this analysis. So with one half hour of data, you, you get this measurement of polarizability that looks pretty good. It's a better than one part in a thousand. But then it's our duty to reproduce this experiment five times today, five times tomorrow with sodium, five times the next day with rubidium, and then back to potassium. When we look at the reproducibility of the experiment, we're left with these uh, statistical uncertainties that are about one or two parts per thousand, even after a month of data. So the statistical uncertainty is pretty good. The systematic uncertainty Here's the beautiful thing about this experiment. It, to a very large extent, cancels out when you report a ratio of polarizabilities. So this is one of the promises that was always made about nanogratings, that they work for multiple different atomic species. And now we're finally making good on that promise that you can report the polarizability ratio of two atomic species with a precision that's now at the level three parts per thousand. And that's just as good as the best theorists that I know. So is Jim Babb still in the room? I think he was on this paper that has a uh, uncertainty of three parts per thousand if you go for that ratio. And uh, here's a, the status of our measurements for the three ratios that we can report and a dozen theoretical calculations over the last 30 years. And the, uh, that theory work by Derevienko is this system, this one here, here, and here, and it agrees very well with our measurements of the ratios of atomic polarizabilities. Other theories are less in good agreement. And this can be compared to measurements in the past, also from the 1970s. Um, so the Miller and Peterson work and the Zorn et al. work, um, those involved an apparatus without nanogratings, no interference, just a, uh, a beam that was deflected by an electric field gradient. And so our, our precision has improved considerably thanks to the nanogratings. It's the fact that we don't require 100 microns of displacement, but just 100 nanometers of displacement. That's enough for us to read out these polarizabilities. What's the error bars on the theory? This theory from uh, yeah. Derevienko and That's Jim Babb, the yeah. they, they used as input some measured lifetimes and some other experimental data oh, okay. in order to uh, <coughs> better inform the theory. Um, and I think Safranova, whose grad student's name must begin with an A, has done a similar thing. So when the theorists, and I think it's a very good practice to encourage when the uh, true blue atomic theorists who do this work, which is difficult because it's a many body perturbation calculation with quantum mechanics and relativistic corrections, um, and that we can provide a benchmark for that Wait, type of work is, is the point. For them to, turn, to turn the theory around. And for example, in that case, the, you know, you measure these very accurate polarizabilities, turn it around to get the lifetimes, for example, or these kinds of things. Right. It We're doing the same kind of things in nuclear physics. And, you know, so we, we provide a number, and then the, the theory has to fit that mm -hmm. number. Is it the S-wave scattering cross-section, the B that's tabulated? Well, when, for well actually, a, dozen? a few, few body nuclear physics, that's okay. the kind of thing that we do. And it, it provides a theorist with a new opportunity to put new uh, uh, air bars on, on, on their work. Right. Well, that's the idea that I think is a, a significant motivation to push this work forward. Um, 
we are trying to do this now for metastable strontium and ground state strontium because of the clock metrology. In fact, if you are familiar with the lattice clocks, you know how the black body radiation shift is the dominant source of the uncertainty. And it's such a big problem that people are building cryogenic uh, optical clocks now in order to nail down this black body radiation shift and, and create a more precise atomic clock. It turns out if we could just measure the polarizability of these and if they could uh, measure the temperature of their apparatus very precisely, that would have a similar effect. So in a, a complementary way, I think we'll contribute to the clock metrology if we can generate these metastable beams of strontium. We already see um, interference and diffraction from our metastable beams of helium and argon with a discharge region here and a direct hit CEM. We're also, to get at the ground state of strontium, limited by some background for the hot wire detector. So we're in another lab setting up the mass filter. And one of the problems regarding reproducibility was uh, gonna, we have to position the electrodes in a, a very precise way. So if we have a more elaborate interaction region, I think we'll have a better shot at having the experiment be more reproducible so the ratios can be even more precisely determined. So that's the direction I'm heading uh, towards precision measurements of polarizability. Here's the motivation in a sense. All of these uh, atoms, even though they're simple systems, uh, I understand that benchmark measurements are still appreciated for the atomic structure calculations. Measurements of cesium polarizability were considered important for parity violation studies, calibrating the theory part of that. And all the clock states actually need a lot of work done to better support the uh, optical clock community. So if you take our measurements and combine them with the work that Dave Pritchard did before I came to MIT, if you use sodium as a reference and use our ratio measurements to report an all experimentally determined polarizability of these two atoms, um, that's the status of the uncertainty now. And if we could do the same thing with lithium as a reference, you see the theory is so well known there, would be even better off. So Jim Babb has encouraged us to go that way. Here's one of the uh, data sets that we had to scrutinize in order to make sure we understood what we were doing with the ratio measurements. Our velocity measurements are only barely good enough to report those ratios at the three parts per thousand. Um, so we're working on other ways to determine the atom beam velocities. And we deliberately, this is an interesting strategy that only came to us as we were planning out this experiment in detail. We deliberately made the diffraction pattern for rubidium, potassium, and sodium look very similar. It's the same distance scale. So we chose the same diffraction angle for each atomic species so they would deal with the same gradients and, and interact with the same part of the interaction fields. So we chose slower velocity rubidium and faster velocity sodium in order to get this to look like this. Okay, now I'll tell you about interaction phases where van der Waals forces uh, cause the phase shift. We put a nano grating in one arm only. So we have the beam splitters, and that's, that's one set of nano gratings. But this fourth grating, the interaction grating, can be put in one arm or the other arm. And this worked pretty well. In 2005, we wrote this FizRev letter on a measured de Broglie wave phase shift due to an array of channels that the atoms had to go through. But it was a, the toughest part was dealing with these unwanted extra beams. You know, there's this, the complementary diamond interferometer down here. So the next move on that project was to collaborate with the Jacques Viguet team in France, where they operate gratings made of standing waves of light. With the Bragg regime gratings, they have a very cleanly defined two-path interferometer. And then we could put the nano grating in just one branch and not have all these other sources of fringes to uh, w contaminate our analysis. So we did that in order to measure the phase shift acquired in the zeroth order transmission as compared to a reference wave that goes far from any surfaces. To create that interaction grating, we learned how to rip a hole with a little glass pipette. And it's a pretty clean transition between intact grating and open space there. And then as we move that around so that in one position, both atom beams go through the gap, so that's a reference phase. Or if we move the interaction grating, we have a reference beam going through the gap and the uh, beam that goes through the grating picks up a phase. Or in the other case, it's the other branch of the interferometer that goes through the nano grating. That's what causes a positive phase shift on one side and a negative phase shift on the other side. 
We can measure this phase now with a precision of 1%. And we can do this at different velocities. And we find an interesting fact. The phase shift picked up due to transmission depends on velocity almost like 1 over the square root of velocity. It's, it's not precisely the square root, nor should it be. And uh, we can use this observed dispersion, velocity-dependent phase shift, in fact, to test the shape of the van der Waals potential. So if you make the ansatz that it's a power law, but you don't say it's 1 over r cubed yet, you can fit for p. And here shows a fit if, uh, if it were 1 over r squared, you'd get this uh, black dashed line, which does not agree with the data. Or if it were a 1 over r to the fourth potential, like you'd expect due to casimir poldler retardation at longer distances, that would be this green line. And it also is ruled out uh, by a chi-squared that limits us to saying that it's best fit by a 1 over r cubed or very close to 1 over r cubed potential. This was interesting because some atom optics experiments, like the group of Cornell at University of Colorado, have observed that contaminations on a surface cause patch potentials or patches of dipoles, add atoms can add to the interaction potential for the atoms that you're studying. So we don't see that. In this system with a modest vacuum and a fast atom beam and irregular nanogratings, we are uh, satisfied with plain old vanilla van der Waals. So. Why does it go with, that way with the velocity? The, Velocity dependence, which is the subject of a long calculation, um, is because when you're very close to the nanograting channels, you wind up with so much phase shift um, that it more or less cancels out. And so the region that is contributing to the observed de Broglie waves in the zeroth order is uh, a restricted region. A smaller zone is contributing coherently as you go to slower velocities. Right, so if you were to in, ask the question, well, what's the phase shift in the near field for one path that's gone only 10 nanometers from the grating? Well, that depends on 1 over velocity, just yeah. like a Feynman path integral, integral of potential energy d time, normal. Yeah. But uh, you wind up with some uh, destructive interference, which is more obvious when you write it down as the cumulant integral and plot the Cornu spiral. So you wind up with these parts that are near the edges not contributing the spatial extent that does not contribute itself depends on velocity. If you wanted to uh, probe new theories of gravity, for example, by adding the uh, Yukawa potential with alpha and lambda that Demopoulos write down, you could also <coughs> set a limit on those parameters, which is very competitive with other atom optics experiments, so that gravity at the 2 nanometer scale isn't 10 to the 28 times larger than Newtonian gravity. That is uh, evident here because this would be the fit to our data if you asked for that modification to Newtonian gravity. So, so your, your uh, sensitivity to setting limits is, is about the same as neutron experiments? No, neutrons are better because neutrons uh, have such a small polarizability that yeah. the van der Waals interaction for neutrons is more negligible. You pick up these nuclear interaction, S-wave scattering, but in fact, at that same alpha lambda parameter space, I, I didn't bring that plot, but I'll tell you that my limits at lambda of 2 nanometers are 10 to the 28 neutron folks. Uh, you can actually interpret those results as four orders of magnitude better at ruling out some of these preposterously large alphas. And the reason is the uh, neutrons go right through some material. They pick up a phase shift. You need to understand some nuclear structure in order to predict it. but. Um, it's not this electromagnetic van der Waals interaction which rears its head much earlier okay. and makes a, uh, a, a big signal that we well, see. Yeah, but we're actually Sorry. trying an experiment now, not in this lecture, but I'll mention it so we can talk more, uh, to set new limits on the neutrality of atoms. Yeah. And that should be actually quite competitive with the neutron limits, something like oh. uh, 10 to the minus 19 E is the uh, limit on the charge of the neutron. So I know the Mark Kasovich group is, measure, is working on that in a way that could be uh, quite advanced. But we're making rapid progress with this polarizability apparatus to uh, also set new limits on the charge of an atom.
uh, your gravity measurement, those numbers are not competitive with the macroscopic experiments like the Washington group and so on. Is that correct? Eric Adelberger at Washington with the Rotwash and the Utwash experiments, they generally are sensitive to these uh, proposed additions or reductions to Newtonian gravity at those length scales of one millimeter or down now to a few microns when they really push hard on their multiple moment probe. But we're happening to be sensitive at two nanometers to 10 nanometers. So it's a different distance range. So, so the, uh, to, let's say 10 nanometers, what is your number again just for an hour and a half for roughly? 10 to the 28 at 2 nanometers. And okay, because our group at the same distance scale is more like 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12 or something like that. These are Casimir experiments. Maybe we'll talk about it afterwards. At I'm the just same distance to... scale of, of nanometers? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a lot better than I've seen on any um, summaries of this work. Well, and I don't advertise that as a particularly hot no, no, field because I, I, I understand there's not a great deal of theoretical motivation to go for those huge, to rule out such large alpha at such small length scale. There was more... Um, yeah, we can talk about it afterwards, but yeah. we are working at the tens of nanometer scale, yeah. Okay, well, I've, I've got those numbers in a plot. I'll bring it up for you later. So, again, it's the nanogratings that work for multiple different atomic species. <coughs> That's the virtue of nanogratings. It's a new application that we're really working on. I showed you the polarizability measurements work better when you have multiple different atoms. Same thing when you go to Van der Waals measurements. So now I'll look at Van der Waals potentials due to four different atoms interacting with the same nanostructure. And one thing we find, this is like a new uh, thing to uncover, is that a lot of the C3 coefficient comes from the core electrons, not just the valence electron. I'll explain that again with reference to Darvienko, who uh, showed how for rubidium atoms, in a prediction with an ideal surface, 35% of C3 should come from core electrons, but only 3% of the polarizability comes from the inner core electrons. So that's an interesting claim. I don't think it's ever been verified so until now. So again, we're, we're doing these comparisons of different atoms. And we started looking at the intensity and two different orders, so the second order and the third order. We're plotting that ratio as a function of velocity for three different atoms. If the van der Waals force didn't exist, if C3 were zero, then this would be the same number for all the atoms and it would be constant, independent of velocity. So that we see trends here is an indication that we are sensing the van der Waals force. And we use these trends <clears throat> then to report the ratio of C3 for rubidium and the ratio with respect to sodium. And so we get these now with 3% precision. And everybody always asks me, OK, you think you're measuring C3, but C3 of what? These are nanogratings that may have a surface layer that's contaminated. There may be oxides or even some pump oil on the surface. But the beautiful thing about ratio measurements is that the actual surface material more or less cancels out. It's uh, because the epsilon of omega is flat over the ranges where the different atoms respond. So I'll, I'll get to that, but I think the way to interpret these ratio measurements is to plot the ratio of C3 for potassium compared to sodium as a function of this quantity, which is the ratio of the DC polarizability and the resonance frequency. So if you do plot it like this, and you had a one oscillator model of an atom, so just considering the valence electron, then the theory would show these ratios all on a line that goes through 0, 0. So for zero polarizability, zero van der Waals force. For a standard polarizability, you'd go through 1, 1. And then for more polarizable atoms, you'd have uh, larger van der Waals interactions, but right on this line. The deviation from this line requires calculations that include core electrons. And it turns out not to matter very much what you do with the various models of the surface. We've included metals or insulators or multi-layer surfaces. And we always see how it's a deviation from this line that it points a finger at this uh, atomic polarizability model. So the Lifshitz formula for C3 is often written this way. If you use like a, uh, a one oscillator model, Lorentz oscillator model for the atomic polarizability as a function of omega, you'd put this in here. And the surface response can be written down a few different ways. But when we study these ratios, it's this thing that we see is wrong when we observe this uh, offset from the line. So we attribute these shifts from such a line as an indication that the core electrons 
are significant for the C3. And there's another shift here that's from a different origin. This is uh, because there's some deflection of paths within the grating. It's really only significant for our lithium measurements, but we see that we have to go beyond the Iconel approximation to explain those data. OK, I'll recap what I understand, and then I've got some things I don't understand about decoherence to sh share with you. Uh, the basic conclusions from this work are that nanogratings work for electrons, and that ratio measurements of polarizability improve the precision that we can offer. And we've done the ratio measurements with van der Waals forces too. But now let's talk about decoherence. Uh, with Dave at MIT, we scattered photons, and we saw that the contrast in the interferometer went down as you turn up the laser power. And then we took a detailed look at Arizona. We looked even harder at how the contrast doesn't go down quite as fast when you add background gas pressure in this apparatus. The first thing you notice is Beer's law. You just lose flux. So it's as if the bad collisions scatter atoms out of the detected beam. So that we can fit the decay of contrast and intensity and compare those. Now I'm showing contrast loss versus intensity loss in this experiment uh, that I call gas decoherence. This is kind of a nice way to parameterize what type of collisions are we dealing with? How, how big of an angular distribution does our detector really collect? And I want to advertise there are many ways to go down here. This was a contrast loss with no intensity loss. Going down this way was photon decoherence. When we add a little gas in the electron apparatus, we saw this. We saw intensity loss only, no loss of contrast. And that the gas decoherence for atoms follows this curve, or if we make the detector bigger or make the slits wider, we've actually seen it follow some other curve. Um, those are all interesting ways now to catalog decoherence. Did you? Yes, it depends on the coherence volume which you have and how many uh, gas, gas uh, particles you have in it. Is it fluctuating quantity or is it a huge amount? That's a nice way to think of it. So if, and to go to some extreme case, if you had a, well, well, I've got a lot of things to chat with you about decoherence later on. Let me get to the part that's like a model under development for why it is that the surface ought to also do some scattering and cause a loss of contrast. But we don't see that. Um, so does the surface cause decoherence? And here's an example of a toy model of a surface. Let me replace the surface with one atom or a, a lattice of atoms or the whole surface. But the uh, concept is, as the electron goes whizzing past, it interacts with the surface. You get a local polarization. And that should radiate. And you should have the electron, in fact, give up some of its kinetic energy. So I I'll try to get at that by saying, as the electron goes past, I can now tell you what's the electric field at the location of this surface atom as a function of time. So electric field as a function of time, I know. And now if I want to find the uh, induced dipole, I know alpha of omega, so I better Fourier transform this to get electric fields as a function of frequency. Put that in here, get, get induced dipole as a function of frequency, and inverse Fourier transform. Now I can tell you the induced dipole moment as a function of time. And as the electron whizzes past, it makes the electric field shown in red here for the uh, x direction. That's up and down. And in z, so the electric field first this way and then this way. Um, is shown in red, but that the induced dipole rings is uh, the nature of a resonant object. So as the electric field parametric in time makes this little map, the atom parametric in time gets kicked, and then it keeps ringing long after the uh, electron has gone past. So to excite that motion is going to cause some decoherence. It's going to cause the potential energy that the electron interacts with, uh, the potential energy for the moving electron should be lesser because the surface hasn't responded yet. The faster it goes, the less it is going to change the potential compared to far away from the surface. Moreover, there is a force, even in this toy model, there is a force on the electron that's in the direction of velocity. So I'd call that a, a drag or a friction force. So that should cause the electrons to lose energy so much as a microvolt. And uh, depending on how that energy is uh, picked up by the surface, it should cause a loss of contrast. And we never have seen that yet. Um, 
So studying diffraction tablet images and fringes, I've never seen any evidence of decoherence due to the electron surface interaction. And here's three guesses as to why not. First, maybe there's only a femtosecond of interaction time and the uh, spectrum of excitations, like the surface plasmons in the structure, cannot accept one microelectron volt. So um, if there's a, it turns out to be a nanowatt of power is transferred from the electron to the surface to the structure of the grating due to these models. And uh, in a femtosecond, that's only a micro EV of energy that should be dumped. So maybe the surface just doesn't have the density of states to take it. So maybe it's like you're saved by quantum mechanics. Or maybe the energy loss of a few microelectron volts comes in the form of some long wavelength excitations, like uh, radio wave emission. Um, and that might not reveal which path the electron takes. But I have to be honest and say that there are a lot of technical problems when we go to lower energy beams or higher energy beams. The beam focus changes, the beam initial coherence changes. So this obscures my ability to uh, be quite as precise as I'd like to report no decoherence for electrons. So the conclusion of that work is we, we can study the onset of decoherence for atoms, but for electrons I've either seen no coherence at all or good enough coherence to have uh, pretty good contrast. Um, and so as long as you coat the gratings with a bit of metal, they work for electrons and these other businesses we've talked about. Thank you for your attention, and that's it. No, very interesting, Alex. Um, <coughs> other questions, Herman? Sure. You said that it's hard to figure out what the uh, decoherence are. I, I guess in this case, for the electrons, you mean either D phase, any, any reduced contrast, right? Uh, you said it's hard to, to see that. Uh, can you just look at your diffraction pattern you mentioned earlier, just looking at the at how high quality is that will be a measure of your transverse coherence, right? So uh, we did this, right? As you know, with gradings, of, you know, 50 eV or 80 eV electrons, and you, if then you see that that the peak structure starts falling apart in comparison with the diffraction pattern, uh, or, or, or that you can determine without the grading. So I never had the pleasure of using the apparatus in the way that you used yours to put the grating in and out and see the beam with the same focusing go from a smaller spot to a, an array of more blurred spots. I, I saw how you analyzed that as a uh, decoherence mechanism characterized by some length scale of some yeah. local charge on the grating. Um, all I can say is the diffraction pattern uh, looked completely unresolved and unable to even call diffraction when the grating was not dosed with metal. And when we put just a dusting of gold, not even enough to make a macroscopic conductivity, then we do get ample diffraction patterns to recognize as such. Yeah, it's funny. The analysis was based on also on electron microscope images where you see just little structures, islands on, the, you know, on that grating surface, which is, and so it seems that there's multiple mechanisms, right? So Apart from Hasselbach and Zurich mechanism, there seems to be uh, an impossible dephasing localized islands. And then you have, now you're saying maybe another dynamical mechanism that gives rise to maybe energy loss, right? He's, he's re-radiating. That's a separate mechanism, right? Is that right? Yes, I propose it as a mechanism. In fact, I'm still stumped as to why it works at all. So I'd say the exploration into coherent electron optics with nanogratings the best thing it's done for us is to provide the surprise that it does work. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the electron optics experts like Tonomura uh, could have told us that in advance, but it was <laughs> worth trying it just to see that these might offer a new tool in electron optics. Yeah. Well, I'm still searching for the greatest application you know, to motivate uh, continuing that apparatus. Yeah. Uh, Howard, uh, it's only again coming back to this uh, early measurement with the electron um, through the lattice where you have rotated the lattice and you get this asymmetry yes, in the intensities. Have you done that for different thicknesses of these lattices or for different materials also? Or is there an effect expected? We haven't done it with different thicknesses of gratings. Um, we've done this work a lot more with atoms because the, that trapezoidal structure uh, also causes a slightly asymmetric or blazed diffraction pattern for atom transmission. And in fact, 
that geometry strongly influences what we find um, for the best fit C3 coefficient. So unfortunately, there's a correlated fit between the, the uh, size of the nanograding channels and the best fit van der Waals coefficient. So we did quite a lot of work on that. And last year, there's a fizz reve from us on what we call the magic open fraction, in which that correlation is uh, no longer a problem. So we did find there's a particular set of open fractions or equivalently incident angles that give you uh, better access to measuring C3 directly without need to know the geometry of the grading. Is the transversal coherence? How much is that? Uh, for those experiments where you see resolved diffraction, the transverse coherence length is several nanostructure bars. Oh, okay. yeah. Several of them. Right. And as Herman was alluding to, roughly how well resolved is the diffraction pattern indicates how coherent is the beam. Uh, I had two questions. The charged needle electron interferogram reminded me that original Aharonov poem experiments were done with a long fiber uh, that a whisker. Was, yeah, well, there was also one with a, a uh, spider. Yeah, and then there was the whisker made into a solenoid. But the, uh, the two pads were often provided by what they called the biprism interferometer which was exactly the mechanism that you had of charging the wire to a high enough voltage so that the <coughs> electrons. That's right. So the Mollenstadt by Prism yeah, uh, has been the workhorse of yeah. electron interferometers. I hope we'll hear a lot about the so, state of the art in that. It wasn't clear whether you were just putting a couple of fairly well controlled and aligned gratings in front of a by Prism wire or whether a needle, to my mind, it goes only halfway through or something. Yeah, it, in fact, you'd see a different effect. Yeah, you would see it, I think. <clears throat> so that the edge of the needle some brings of the with same it things, gradients of gradients is what causes curvature in these yeah. fringes. <clears throat> you just cause a cut, only a cut, not a, uh, such a distortion if you had a perfect biprism there. Oh. I think it's worth seeing that movie again just to... Uh, Explain that point. And, what, and what's happening in it? Is the, the charge so, going up? Oh, no, you're, you're focusing it different. Yeah. So this, here, just to be honest, um, I feel uncomfortable calling this a hologram. Because it's yeah, not, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a distorted set of fringes. I'll give you that. But calling it a hologram is glorifying this more than it may be. Because it's, it's a fringing apparatus, yeah, fringing yeah, interferometer. Interferometer. Shearing interferometer. Is it Sh it? Shearing interferometer. A uh, sharing interferometer has paths that are overlapping and therefore only report gradients in index of refraction. If, if the wire had continued all the way through, then where the wire is formed here would give you a cut, and this set of the image would just shift that way, and this set would just shift that way. But you get these uh, deviations from straight lines due to double gradients. So in essence, we can map double gradients in the line integral of electric potential. The, the so question do you call that an electric field mapping tool? It's yeah, not quite yeah, yet. Yeah, you need to do a little more tomography of such an object to make yeah. it useful. Yeah, it's just an indication that it's going on. The, the, uh, the second question related to, you, uh, I forgot what you call it, a Gaussian shell model, something like that. Um, it was a, a little surprising to me, but it probably shows my ignorance of time reversal invariance or some kind of symmetry. You had two overlapping pads, one that came from zeroth order followed by first order diffraction. The second mm -hmm. was minus one, let's, no, it was plus one followed by bending back towards the same. Remember where you got, and they're very clear fringes, there it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I was a little surprised that, of yeah, yeah, there are several of them. I was surprised that the, um, in order to get such clear patterns, the intensities on the two pads should be the same. Now, the pads are equal in length, but I don't understand why you can diffract out of the minus one direction forward as strongly as from 
maybe maybe that's always yeah, true. Yeah, so you're right. This map shows you psi squared. It's the probability. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, it looks like it's psi squared for one of them and the other one just one. Well, this is really also the intensity being right out there. Uh, mapped into this color scale to make it easy to see. Oh, so maybe it's not as, oh, I see. So it, it may not be as strong a contrast as I right. interpreted it. This, this uh, When you don't have equal beams, system. you can't get full uh, contrast. You're right. That's, that's one of the reasons that this atom interferometer with nano gratings does not have visibility of 100%. Uh, another reason is that we always get some of the zero, zero, zero flux still hitting our detector. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, so I, uh, I, I was over-interpreting the false color problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, well, I want to exercise the chairman's prerogative to reduce the extent to which I've been made into a straw man here. Early in your talk, you said that I said you couldn't do this with electrons. In fact, uh, what I said was it looks, it looks right on the edge of my envelope calculations as to whether it's feasible or not. Um, but I am very surprised to the extent to which it seems much more feasible than the electron uh, things gave. And in particular to your suggestion that perhaps uh, one of the reasons is that if you have very long wave uh, wavelength excitations generated in the grating, since you can't get which way information by that, uh, then that may be happening and you're still okay, like in your energy loss. But my question was, can you think of a scheme where you're uh, looking at one beam that went through a grating interfering with another one that didn't. For instance, in the atom experiments, if you put the grating in one arm but not in the other, it's clear that there can be no long wave or anything else radiation from that grating because it would still provide which way information if it works. And I wondered if there's an analog for electrons. But that would need a well-resolved interferometer with a geometry like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't built that yet. I think Hermann Bedelon has, so perhaps we should ship the interaction grating that has gone to Toulouse, uh, now back to Tucson. We can ship it to Nebraska and put it in your machine. And the prediction there is if you have some friction, even if it's a predictable energy loss due to transmission, then the interference fringes should be uh, time dependent. They should be uh, now rolling past in time. And if you have an integrating detector, both in space and time, you just see a, a real contrast loss which we did not see with atoms. So mm -hmm. that, okay. that's a right. new frontier just, in energy loss. So now, now can you go to lower and lower electron energies in this machine and still see coherence? It's tough when you go below. That's why we tried all these different detectors. Herman has pushed the envelope below 50 volts. I have not used beams lower than 500 volts because the E-beam gets very squirrely. When you start going to lower energy, the lenses have a, a finer range over which you can operate them. Any contamination on the uh, beam tube becomes more of a big deal. Compensating techniques for a home rebuilt machine just weren't good enough. And the detectors aren't as good when you go lower in energy. So okay. technical problems is all. Well, I think we should break for lunch and should be back here at uh, 2 o'clock. But let's thank all the speakers. I thought this was very